Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Noel's going to give a presentation about One Medicine. Uh, we're the first people to have heard this presentation, so thank you so much for bringing it to us. It's a great privilege to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I do appreciate it. And uh, as Rosie said, this is the first time I've presented this, but it is my life's mission. There's no way that I would let the television camera into my practice and uh, look at me every day if it wasn't for some bigger cause. Do we pay any attention to our responsibility for one planet? Do we realize we're not alone on it? Do we realize when we wake up in the morning and we hear a bird song that that is a true honor? And do we realize that in the next two generations that may not be the case anymore? So ladies and gentlemen, today I'm here to talk to you about a planet that is shrinking and a situation where animals are giving us drugs and implants every day. Now I'm not saying you can't have safe drugs and implants. That's not what I'm saying at all. Of course you need safe drugs and implants. What I am saying is that there might be a better way. So all of those animals that give their lives to give you a drug or an implant, you take it for granted because you don't think. And that's not your fault. You've been conditioned not to think because that's the society you live in. There may be a better way, and that way is called reciprocity. And what I mean by that is that if all of the love that existed in my consulting room every single day was packaged, and if we could bottle it, ladies and gentlemen, if we could bottle it, how much could we spray that around the world? And would it matter? Would it matter the love that Rosie felt for her dog when she's holding that dog? Does that matter, and would it make the world a better place? I strongly believe it would. I very much believe that reciprocity gives rise to hope. And the only reason I make the TV show is that every single day, I'm so privileged that people allow us into their lives to show you hope. I get letters from kids across the world. I had a letter a couple of weeks ago from a kid in Syria. Both parents dead, auntie in broken English wrote, thank you for giving me hope. Now that's what I'm talking about. The moment that you hold an animal and there is unconditional love, and if we could spread that around the world, we could create something that has never happened and should have happened years ago. One, medicine is not a new idea, it's a very old idea. Look at this. Between animal and man medicine, there's no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience constitutes the basis of all medicine. Look at this, that's 1900, ladies and gentlemen. What have we done for 116 years? Nothing. Because we haven't shown the kind of respect that could allow human and animal medicine to move forward together. We're not that different. Hello, little Labrador. Hi, mate. How are you? <laughs> He's up straight away. He's like talking to me. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Love you, man. So, 254 years ago, Claude Beaujolais set up the vet school in Lyon in France. And look at that light coming from heaven into the abdomen of a horse. To consult nature and seek out analogies that may be of service to the human species. I'm thinking to myself, really? Did I sign up to serve you or to serve him? Boy or a girl? Ah, hello, lovely. Sorry for a mistake. I didn't see the, you know, the bits there. <laughs> Sorry about that, sweetheart. What's her name? Pippa. Hi, Pippa. Thank you for coming. Love you lots. So, Pippa, unfortunately, all of these people set up my profession to look after you, to serve them. Can you believe that? And she's going, no. <laughs> Can't believe that. Because, you see, the challenge is that most one medicine concepts use animals as an experiment to give you your drug or to give you your implant. And that's fine, because we want you to have safe drugs and implants. However, there's more money in humans. It's going to be millions and millions of dollars spent on developing drugs and implants for you, because then they're going to sell it just to you, because there's less money, regardless of what you may think, yeah, in treating that. Pippa than in treating all of these people. And therefore, vets and docs don't collaborate, and therefore, platforms for helping animals as well as humans don't really exist well, and it takes effort to give Pippa a fair deal. I'm going to give you 10 quick examples of why we could build a middle ground. A middle ground, ladies and gentlemen, between the experiments that give you the drugs and the implants you want, and the ground we'd like to go to, which is a more compassionate world. Because remember, everything I'm talking to you about is hope. And unless you listen to this, the world is rapidly running out of hope. Now, all of these diseases are going to affect you and Pippa. And isn't it amazing that we recognize Ebola only when it affects us? 
And yet the World Health Organization know it's in fruit bats. So that gets into a child, and all of a sudden it goes in a nurse to America, and then, oh yeah, now we're going to pay notice, aren't we? Do we really care the fruit bat? No, we don't really care. What about MRSA? If it affects Pippa, is it of less significance than if it affects Flora? Now, this is a serious question, because it's the same bug with the same resistance pattern, and we're yielding that resistance pattern by the overprescription of antibiotics. So it's a real issue, as it is with cancer, because God bless us all, hopefully we won't get cancer. But as I've already told you, half of all men and one third of all women are going to get cancer. Is cancer the same in Pippa and Flora? Pretty much, pretty much the same. And yet, governments and industry will spend billions of dollars, an average of 300 million to get a drug to market, and less than 90% of them actually make it into humans. Why? Because of the attrition that's created by a model that isn't working very well. So we're talking here about one medicine which gives a fair deal to Pippa and a fair deal to this little girl. And that's going to be very important because with a heterogeneous cell population of cancer in either of those species, it's much more accurate than a homogeneous cell population injected into a mouse. Now, I'm not saying you can't do the mouse model. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if we had bone cancer in this dog, we have a genetic type that has 265 genes exactly the same as a human. Why are we ignoring the fact that this dog wants to live? Why are we ignoring the fact that if we're going to give a drug or an implant to that dog, we could do the same thing in a young lady that has it? God forbid. Right? So moving forward with implants, for example, this is Professor Gordon Blon at UCL, his work with bone growing onto implants. Is that little girl there that different to that Labrador? They've got the same cancer. They can have the same implants, and when we put these implants into a dog, and I'm purposely shocking you to wake you up a little bit to the point that that implant that I'm putting into that dog and making that dog run around the field like that is identical to the implant in the little girl. And that information should be shared between vets and human doctors, rather than just reinventing the wheel. You're getting the penny dropping here. So if I have a situation here where I'm doing a replacement of the top of a femur in a dog that has cancer, this dog was the friend of a man who also had cancer, and all he wanted to do was run around with his dog. And every Saturday night, he sent me the pedometer readings of where they'd been walking for that week, for as long as that dog was alive. And then when the dog died, he, he allowed that dog to contribute to the literature showing how the tendons and the bone grew into the implant. Now, would you want to know that when Pippa dies? Yes, you would. But it's emotive issue. It's a very emotive issue because of Pippa. And my moral obligation is to look after the animals. But was I looking after that animal? Yes. Was I providing quality of life? Yes. Did we all learn together? Yes. This is another example that I did three weeks ago. This is the world's first injection of stem cells into a biological scaffold to save a dog's leg. Now, if we win with that, ladies and gentlemen, if we win with that, why would you not want to know that? Why would you need to do another thousand experiments to know what I already know? And let me give you the final example of hope. It's utter nonsense that we are developing artificial limbs for animals right now based on Professor Gordon Blunds and Catherine Prendergast's work at University College London where they studied the deer antler that gave rise to the first bone on growth, skin on growth model. And then we were the first people in the world to use it in animals. This is eight and a half years ago, and right now we've got to a point with a new model where we can take this leg, and I'm leaving it up just to shock you, because you have to make the decision to chop that leg off or save it. Now, if you do choose to save that leg, and you get that animal running around the field on a blade again with an osseointegrated and a skin-integrated implant, would you go back to the drawing board then and say, oh, I'll tell you what, Fitzpatrick's already done this dozens of times. Now, if I've already done it, why don't you start where I've stopped and carry on with your model there? Well, right now, the regulations don't allow us to do that, which I am completely against. So the reality is, to do that, we need a platform. And that's why I've created the Humanimal Trust, which is a charity. You'll get leaflets on the way out about that. And this is my life's purpose. It is the only reason that I do the TV show, the only reason that I limp down here to talk to you, and the only reason I was born. So I'm encouraging you to listen to this, because you only have one planet. You have one universal love. And if you loved that dog, and if you loved that child, and if you could spray it around the world, my God, 
wouldn't the world be a great place? But you can only do that with one medicine. Thank you very much. What would we have to do to make this marriage? Three things. I've got to tackle the public. That is you, which is why I'm here. I've got to tackle medical, uh, the medical establishment and the veterinary establishment. And then, once those three things are willing to move, then it's a change of government policies. So why are we not pushing some boundaries? Oh, my God. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Why are we not? Of course we should be Is that because to we other. care? We think of an animal as, go back to your medic the other day, it's only a dog. Yes, I'm the one that puts my head above the parapet. It's easy to shoot at me, isn't it? Oh, Fitzpatrick is just doing this because he wants to be on television. Really? The only reason I do it is to get to talk to you to change their minds so they go out and change another hundred minds. When did you make a decision that you would put an animal down on television? And, I mean, that's tough. I had endless rows. I had written scientific papers, ladies and gentlemen, for 20 years that none of you have ever read, because they're boring. <laughs> and making medicine sexy is not easy. <laughs> and giving people access to medicine and then getting a platform to speak to you is actually what it's all about. So when, we, when Jim and my friend and I, we bought a camera, because no producer at any channel would listen to me after we did Bionic Fate in 2010. Right. I wanted to make a story about love. I said, I want to make a story about love. I want to bottle the love that's in my consulting room every day, and I want to make the world a better place. And they're like, are you kidding me? That's not good enough. We don't want a fluffy, feely science program. And I'm like, no, that's not what I want to make. I want to make a show about love. And part of that is tragedy. And I can't tell you how much I'm grateful for the honest people, humans with integrity, mm -hmm. that allow us to show that on television, because it's really hard to show failure. Then people accuse you of, oh, you can walk on water, all you show every week is success. Not true. We try and show failure, but that's really hard for people to go through. This week you had a, in your show Stuffy. Mm. Who, who, what was, how did that come uh, happen at the know, end of... I truly believe that the real important decisions we make, we make here. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. In anything we do in life, we make here. So for me, it's heart-rending to show that, but the reason I want you to see that is that is real life and that is our moral responsibility. And every, we're all passing through. All of us can be attached to our car, our job, our fame in men's mouths, total nonsense by comparison with the fact that ultimately this little dog, this little girl, unfortunately, in a hundred years time will no longer be here. But we need to realize we have a very uh, fragile hold on all of it. Mm -hmm. And unless we look after each other, and the animals and the planet, in the next two generations, it's gone. Um, what are the one or two things that you think that you're able to do with a dog or a cat that we're not doing yet? With a uh, one is custom implants. Right. So the limb amputation... And you're doing that with 3D printing? Yes, and, you know, that absolutely. Sort of yeah. So we can print in three dimensions uh, a mechanical and biological scaffold right now that you can't use in a human. Right. But we've already done it, so why not just start where we are and then, and can't, then, then do, do your if you, limited number of experiments, if that is what is required, to get safety and efficacy. But let's work together on the policy makers that are actually going mm -hmm. to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. This is dumb. There's not one person in the Paralympics this year running on an osseointegrated amputation prosthesis. I guarantee you that will not be the case in 20 years' time. But and you it, could speed we that could, up. We could we do that tomorrow. Together. We could do it really? tomorrow if we, could get, if we could get enough human surgeons and the MHRA, which is the governing body in the UK, in the same room with me, we could make that happen tomorrow. That's fantastic. Every single one of you that have watched one of my shows know what stem cells is, know that metal can integrate into bone, know that uh, a dog that was on two legs can walk on four. You know more than perhaps 90% of vets and human doctors are allowing you to know at the moment. So therefore, you can change all of that today if you choose to do so. I am giving you the same responsibility I have of that world on my shoulders, and we should work together. We think we're it. I've been in rooms with rock stars, billionaires, and idiots, all of us. We think we're it. Look up at the sky, for goodness sake, at hey, look at those stars. We are molecules. And I felt useless, helpless, and I felt that the only way I could change the world was to change it through respect for animals. And I genuinely believe if we respected animals, 
It's the mark of a society that respects people, and we would make a better world. I, I, I really do. That. I really agree. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. One, one minute. I'm going to come up there, up there, and then I'm going to come to you. Okay. I'm one of those human doctors, and... Uh... <laughs> Everybody take a good, long, hard look. <laughs> He's the uh, star of the show. Oh, no. So I work in intensive care and all of my patients can't speak, like the lady mentioned, and in mm. fact it feels a lot like veterinary, veterinary medicine and many times. Most of the lessons I've learnt in treating humans in intensive care have been from animal physiology actually, and those textbooks. One thing I wanted to ask is, do you think educating people together, so vets, medics, would that be a way forward? <laughs> Seven years ago, I sat in a room with three other people and we said, would it be a good idea to set up a vet school at the University of Surrey? And I said, yes, there was no money. We needed the will to do it. Sir Professor Christopher Snowden was a man, visionary man. And the vet school is there. I had 210 of them in my class last week. The dream is to put medics and vets together when they're children. They're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years of age, and then they're friends for life. And by the way, I commend you, sir, because if we studied pathophysiology together, don't you realize the cellular mechanisms are entirely the same? And that is why, my friend, you and I should be friends for life, and we are now friends for life, because that's the future. Great. Please give them a huge round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.